Hi, Lee Clemens for NCI's Reports in the Field. Um, very honored to have former Deputy Director Ralph Link on the show today. Um, it's, what an exciting uh, show we have set up for you. Uh, but before I do that, I want to thank uh, some, uh, some people, uh, the fin financial contributions um, that uh, have been put to the show by Dorothy Arnold, uh, Marie Burris, and retired special agent um, Dick McPherson, uh, that I like to call my executive producer, and also the Naval Criminal Investigative Service Association, which without their help, I don't think I could have gotten a lot of these interviews set up. So I want to thank those people. So today we have Mr. Ralph Blinko, who is the uh, retired as the deputy director of NCIS. And I want, before I um, welcome Mr. Blinko, I want to read a special tribute that on, that's in the congressional record, uh, volume 156, number 16, dated Wednesday, February 3rd, 2010. A tribute to Special Agent Ralph Blinko. The Honorable Howard Coble of North Carolina in the House of Representatives, Wednesday, February 3rd, 2010. Madam Speaker, I rise to tribute to Special Agent Ralph Blinko, Deputy Director, Management and Administration of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, who will retire from this agency on February 27, 2010, after 28 years of highly distinguished service. Mr. Blinko began his career as a Special Agent in 1982 with the then named Naval Investigative Service after graduating cum laude from Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. After being selected for and completing the first NIS Special Agent Basic class to graduate from the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, Center's Criminal Investigator Training Program, Mr. Blinko assumed his first duty assignment in San Diego, California. While there, he served on the narcotic squad and became dedicated to investigating procurement fraud matters. Mr. Blanco was the first NCIS case agent to work a Group 1 undercover fraud operation with the FBI codename Sandfish, which resulted in a conviction in multiple con of multiple contractors and naval personnel for kickbacks and bribery. In 1986, Mr. Blanco was short-toured from his assignment in Hawaii and transferred to, to the first of three NCIS headquarters tours to become the co-case agent on Operation Iron Eagle, a massive effort focused on corruption and irregularities committed by members of SEAL Team 6, resulting in numerous indictments and convictions of civilians and military members, including the famed Navy SEAL Richard Marchinko. For his efforts, Mr. Blinko received the Navy Special Act Award and the Department of Defense Inspector General's Award for Investigative Excellence. Following supervisory special agent tours in NCIS Resident Agency, Washington, D.C. and Jacksonville, Florida, Mr. Blinko was reassigned as the supervisory special agent at Rota, Spain. Mr. Blinko believes this, his three years in Spain were amongst the best of his life due to the excellent staff, great work, and close working relationships he developed with the Spanish law enforcement and intelligence agencies. It is also where in Spain where Mr. Blanco led a dedicated team of NCIS personnel whom were credited with saving the lives of two naval officers. As a result, Mr. Blanco was awarded the Navy Superior Civilian Service Medal. In 1995, Mr. Blanco moved to Naples, Italy and served as an assistant special agent in charge and in 1997, Mr. Blinko was transferred back to NIST headquarters, and then in 1999 was appointed to the deputy director position for criminal investigations. It was during this time and period that he was selected to be the Navy's lead for the removal of hundreds of protesters from the Navy's bombing range at Vieques Island, Puerto Rico. A highly emotional crisis received daily international media attention involved multiple federal agencies and briefings to the senior most levels of government. The removal plan was flawlessly executed by Mr. Blinko and received the, he received the Navy's Meritorious Civilian Service Medal for his efforts. After tours as the Special Agent in Charge of NCIS Field Office Washington and Assistant Director for Administration, Mr. Blinko was selected to be the first NCIS Executive Assistant Director for combating terrorism on the tragic events of 9-11. It was during this time period that Mr. Blinko was promoted to the Senior Executive Service and has noted that he is particularly proud 
of the development of the counterterrorism strategies that he and his team put together shortly after 9-11, many which still endure today. Following his 2004 to 2006 assignment as the Executive Assistant Director for Atlantic Operations in Norfolk, Virginia, Mr. Blanco returned to Washington for the final time when he was selected for by former NCIS Director Thomas Petro to be the Deputy Director for Operations, a position which he held during one of the most demanding operational tempos in the agency's history. Some of the highlights of that time period include the Haditha Amdania investigation, the Chimac and Ariel Weinman espionage investigations, and the rebuilding of the NCIS Economic Crimes and Proactive Criminal Operations Program. In 2008, Mr. Blinko moved to the management and administration position and focused much of his time in the areas of leadership development increasing diversity, and the upcoming BRAC moves to Quantico and Fort Meade, and improving the expeditionary communications capabilities of NCIS. In retirement, Mr. Blinko intends to initially volunteer his time and energy to various charitable causes in the greater Washington, D.C. area, and then explore employment opportunities in the private sector. Madam Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Blinko for his 28 years of outstanding public service and to wish him fair winds and following seas as he begins the next chapter of his life. What an amazing tribute. The well, thanks, congressional Lee. record. That's amazing. Well, thanks a million for uh, reading that and uh, it kind of captures a 28 uh, year journey in an amazing organization. You know, I was fortunate, uh, just like you were, to be involved with NCIS at a time of amazing transformation uh, and look forward to talking to you about that, uh, you know, today. So thank you That's for awesome. reading that. Really, really a brought, brought back a flood of memories. Well, I can imagine. Wow. What a, that's, what an honor. That's amazing. So, you know, everybody has a background and I love to talk about people because I want to know where everybody is from. I mean, where do they come from and, and who, who they really are? So can you tell me about your family life when you were young and uh, where you, where you grew up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, was born and raised in the small college town of Charlottesville, Virginia. And uh, my uh, mother was a homemaker. My father was in the insurance industry for years and uh, uh, loved uh, living in Charlottesville. And when I was in the ninth grade, my uh, folks moved to Stanton, Virginia, which is a, again, a small mountain town in the Shenandoah mountains. And I, uh, got just a great education. They went to a public school, but, uh, you know, a small school that, uh, you know, was just uh, excellent, did pretty well academically, uh, also uh, athletically, played football and baseball there, and uh, had several friends, Lee, that uh, parents were in the law enforcement profession, you know, police officers. And uh, from an early age, I was just so impressed with, uh, with law enforcement. You know, the bearing... Uh, that uh, they displayed uh, the ability to go in and, and resolve issues. Always so impressed. So I knew at an early age that I wanted to go into law enforcement in some way, shape, or form, to the extent that uh, my college selection uh, centered around uh, criminal justice. And I identified Guilford College, which is in Greensboro, North Carolina, and uh, they are considered to have one of the top criminal justice programs uh, in the South and uh, was fortunate enough to be accepted there and immediately declared my, uh, you know, my major as being criminal justice. And uh, uh, so did pretty well academically uh, at Guilford and it leads me to now my senior year uh, at Guilford. I was doing my, my internship at the North Carolina Adult Probation and, and Parole Department. Uh, North Carolina combines both probation and parole. Okay. And uh, at that juncture, I thought for sure that I was either, uh, upon graduation from Guilford, was going to be either a probation officer or potentially start with the uh, Greensboro Police Department. Uh, sure. My uh, girlfriend, soon to be fiance, had one more year left at Guilford, thought I was gonna stay in North Carolina to be close to her. And so, uh, you know, that was going to be my focus. And there's a there's a philosophy that I have come to uh, kind of embrace, particularly as we get a little bit older here in, in life, 
Yeah, sure. And that is, it goes something like, at the moment of commitment, the universe conspires to assist you. And uh, there's probably no better quote, Lee, to describe me than that. So at the moment I committed to kind of going into law enforcement, uh, the universe did so much. And by the way, also mentors. Uh, <laughs> I did a lot to, uh, and family, uh, did a lot to assist me in my journey. Uh, and what that's going to lead me to is kind of the, the how I got led to NCIS. And uh, it's an amazing story. Um, about probably about a month before I was going to graduate at Guilford, there was a career day. And at the career day, you know, local sheriff's departments were there. The local police department was there. Uh, State Patrol, you know, some of the bigger named, uh, you know, DEA, FBI, uh, Secret Service uh, were there recruiting. And it just so happened that that day, uh, NIS, you know, soon to be NCIS, Special Agent uh, Richard Peck, uh, Dick Peck, Dick who Peck. was the, at that time, the Special Agent in Charge in Cherry Point, North Carolina, had been on a recruiting trip at Wake Forest University uh, in Winston-Salem. He was driving back to Cherry Point. He had seen the sign for Guilford College for years and mm -hmm. said, you know what, I'm going to stop into Guilford and just drop off a few brochures uh, at the career services. So Lee uh, Dick walks into the career services department, introduces himself, and they say, well, son of a gun, you know, today is our career day. Would you <laughs> mind just setting up a booth? Dick could have you just waved that off. You know, he wasn't prepared. He didn't have, you know, any you know, sure. materials, things such as that. He agreed to do it. And, um, and so he has like this makeshift booth amongst all the other big organizations. And uh, I see Naval Investigative Service. And I knew at that juncture, I, I did not intend to go into the military. I saw Naval, I thought for sure it was military, you know, mm -hmm. uh, related. I walked right past them. One of my professors, John Grice, uh, mm -hmm. pulled me by my arm and said, hey, listen, you, know, you got to go talk to that guy. He's telling me that they're civilians, that they are paid at the same uh, amount of money that, the, you know, the FBI, DEA, et cetera. But their mission encompasses all their missions, just focused on the Department of the Navy. Lee, based upon that, on a whim, I go over and start speaking to Dick Peck, who immediately, uh, his, uh, you know, kind of the infectiousness uh, about NIS really comported upon me to the extent that uh, NIS was the only federal agency that I applied with, uh, based upon that just uh, conversation. So the, for kind of the first point in my career or my life really about the universe conspiring to assist me mm -hmm. was that day when John Grice grabbed me by the arm and had me talk to, to Dick Peck. So, so fortunate that that happened. I uh, went into the screening board process. When I graduated at Guilford, sure. uh, I went to work immediately for an entertainment security firm. Uh, and we provided security at uh, big PGA tournaments, NASCAR races, a That's lot of cool. concerts. We were with Van Halen and oh, nice. Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, a whole variety of, 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 of different groups like that. But I was going through the screening process. And as you know, from your own history, uh, uh, back then, I actually heard your interview about your four hour interview with Dave Swindle. Oh, I went through a yeah. similar four, uh, four hour interview. Um, and Wet bullets. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and and uh, uh, and so uh, go through that, go through the interview process. I'm still working in the entertainment security firm. Well, you know, months go by while my background investigation is being done. Now it takes us up to Thanksgiving of 1981. And uh, the day after Thanksgiving, the way that the company that I worked for uh, in Greensboro operated is you had to sign commitment letters and I uh, was getting ready to sign uh, over that weekend, over Thanksgiving weekend, another six-month commitment to the company. And again, the universe conspiring to assist me on that Friday after Thanksgiving, I get a phone call from Dick Peck uh, saying, congratulations, you're going to join our ranks and you're going to be going to Naval Station San Diego in February of 1982. Uh, one of the happiest days of my life because, uh, you know, I knew that uh, 
uh, NIS slash NCIS was going to be, you know, my home um, yeah. based upon all that I had learned and from talking to the existing agents. So again, just one of the happiest days of my life is uh, the day after Thanksgiving in 1981. That's amazing. Yeah, that that, uh, that screening board process is. I always like to get everybody's screening board interview process because everybody has a great stories about going through that uh, that interview. The crazy questions, some of the questions that were asked. Because what can you ask in four hours? I mean, they have to. And uh, you know, Dave Swindle even said he goes, "Well, we we're just messing with you at that point. <laughs> right? <laughs> we know we're going to hire you. We we liked you. So, and I'm sure the same thing happened to you." It did to a certain extent. Uh, I can laugh about it now. Of course, as you said, it was excruciating uh, going yeah. through it. Um, and uh, but uh, obviously it, it uh, went well to the extent that, you know, I ended up getting the offer. And uh, and then next thing you know, February 1st, 1982, I'm in uh, San Diego, California, starting my uh, my career. And interestingly, Lee, I don't know what your walk in life was like, but until I had taken this job with uh, with NIS, the furthest west I had ever been was West Virginia. I, and uh, I agree with you. I think it was the Alabama line with Mississippi for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never been on an airplane. Yeah. My first uh, my first airplane ride was flying from snowy Raleigh, North Carolina. Stopping over in San Diego and, uh, you know, 75 degrees and, you know, light winds and sunny. It was life changing for me, you know, being an East Coast guy and, you know, and starting on the West Coast. As you probably know, yep. uh, I don't remember because I know you came on like around 1989. I, don't, I think we still kind of did it with, with your tenure of agents. But back then they did these moves of commitment and NIS did where it did. they would take East coast guys, you know, sending them to the West coast right. and vice versa. And uh, initially I didn't understand it. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, I had wanted to start at Lejeune or mm -hmm. Charleston back when Navy had a good presence in Charleston. Um, but uh, you know, thank goodness it was, it was Naval station, San Diego. Well, my, my story with that was when I, I called back and they say, hey, you're going to Naval Station San Diego. I'm, I'm in Decatur, Alabama, and I'm just like, I'm so happy that they called me and they're going to hire me. Uh, hire me. And, and uh, so I asked them, they said, we're well, going to uh, 32nd Street Naval State Station, 11 ND. Uh, that's where you're going to be. I said, oh, OK, great. Um, but there are no jobs in the South. Nope. No jobs in the South. You're going to San Diego. OK, roger that. Good to go. So, uh, you know, I, I do the same thing. I go to, so you know how it was in those days. I don't know if it, for you, you went to the office first, you spent about a week there, or you spent some time there, and then you went to FLETC, to Federal, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. I get there in a class of 48 agents, you know, new agents. Um, there were eight of us going to California. Guess where the other 40 were going? <laughs> yeah, sure. To the Southeast, East Coast. Absolutely, of course. I guess that's just how it rolls. And I was like, well, at that point, I was glad to be in San Diego. Loved the weather. People were great. The boss was great. I I couldn't have asked for a better situation. Same exact experience that I had, Lee. Uh, I was uh, so fortunate to have started at Naval Station San Diego. In my case, when I started in February 1982, my basic class wasn't scheduled till June. Okay. Wow. So it was five months later. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, uh, you know, I, I was not yet firearms qualified. So literally my third day on the job, my assistant special agent in charge, and again, blessed to have had Frank Milia as my right. first special agent, uh, assistant special agent in charge. My first special agent in charge was Lyman Butterfield. And, you know, I'm a 22 year old kid right out of college, basically. On my third day, Frank took me up to uh, Miramar got me qualified in a day. Remember, I had never shot a handgun in my entire life. And he was able to teach me uh, all the way to the point that I qualified. The next day, Lee, you know, after one week on the job, I had a, I had a, you know, a caseload and a yeah. gun. And, <laughs> and also, by the way, uh, an excellent mentor uh, at that initially part, the initial part. And then when I came back in basic class, uh, Kim Myers, who ended up becoming Kim Myers Ussery, I could not have asked for, we really didn't have a, a formalized field training agent, right. uh, you know, uh, capability back then, but she basically, for all intents and purposes, was, was my FTA. You no, know, Kim, is, she's trained a lot of leadership in this organization. No doubt about it. And she certainly taught me how to write 
the NCIS way, how to speak the NCIS way, how to investigate the NCIS way. Right. And uh, a lot of my you know, future success, if you will, I absolutely trace back to you know those, those three magical years at 11 ND sure. uh, Naval Station San Diego with the likes of Frank Milia, Lyman Butterfield, uh, ultimately Doug Tomasso, who became my ASAC, and then of course Kim Kim uh, Kim Myers Ushery. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you get the coveted uh, pewter badge at that time? <laughs> Did they yeah. give you something to carry? Yeah, actually, believe it or not, I got a real badge and really? real credentials because I had qualified and uh, and I worked a case that actually testified uh, in a uh, uh, a auto theft case uh, <laughs> where a sailor had stolen another sailor's case uh, before I went to uh, uh, to basic class. And I remember the uh, young uh, Navy JAG officer trying to figure out how to skirt around the fact that I hadn't even been to basic class. And here I'm, you know resolving these cases so uh oh but as you read in my bio uh, again another part of the universe you know conspiring to help me I, I cannot tell you but in my opinion the great fortune that myself and bob mcsherry and the other people in my basic class had mm. with being the first class to uh, go to the basic criminal investigator course at fletzy um, awesome. You know, prior to that time as you well know uh nis agents their academy uh, was in Suitland, Maryland, and mm -hmm. uh, it was it was a solid academy, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for the most part, uh, it was you know NIS agents training NIS agents, um, and uh, and so I was able to go to a Fletzi, where I had the great opportunity to learn not only the Uniform Code of Military Justice and how to operate within that, but then also within you know the uh, federal court system as well. So we learned how to uh, write not only command authorized searches, if you will, uh, within the military system, but also search warrants. Um, mm -hmm. So we learned you know both sets of rules, both sets of laws, uh, trained uh, in both areas. And that served me so well because pretty soon after graduating from basic class, you know, I found myself uh, you know working uh, procurement fraud cases. Um, when I first graduated uh, from a basic and came back to Naval Station, almost instantly I went to the drug squad. You know, young guy uh, and uh, you're 22 kind of years old, 22 yeah. years old, you know, yep. living the life, right? Working a uh, uh, Miami Vice was the big show on then, you know, so kind of living <laughs> the Miami Vice lifestyle. And uh, I loved working drug cases. I really oh, did. Yeah. This was, uh, you know, about the time when the military was just adapting the analysis test. So, for the most part, if you had a, you know several good informants, you were working you know big big case. I worked with DEA and the local narcotics task force, and just loved that life. And what happened is, you know, in the mid 1980s, the Defense Department was being plagued uh, by procurement scandals. If you recall, and I know that you were just uh, you were enjoying the good life at the University of Alabama at the time, but <laughs> sure, uh, you know, the Navy uh, and DOD was plagued by you know, $600 toilet seats and, you know, $1,000 hammers and cost mischarging cases. As a result, DOD uh, invested money in all the military criminal investigative organizations to stand up a procurement fraud capability. And my uh, special agent in charge at the time, a man by the name of Don McCoy, came to me and said, listen, good news, you've been selected to go into the procurement fraud program. And Lee, I got to tell you, I was so disappointed uh, because I didn't want to work. I wanted to work drug cases. You it's, know? it's fun. It was fun. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, uh, fraud cases at that time had the reputation of being, you know, boring paper cases. Again, the universe conspires to help me. Best thing that ever happened to me. I served more search warrants, did more arrest warrants work more high profile cases, you know, working fraud cases than I had, you know, in the other disciplines. So it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And uh, shortly after uh, going to uh, to training uh, for, for fraud, I came back. And as you read in the bio, uh, the FBI and NCIS, we started a, a group one undercover operation because there were indicators that there was widespread kickbacks uh, and bribery going on 
in the kind of the maritime community in San Diego, as you can imagine, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent uh, in and around San Diego uh, in the Navy uh, for things like ship repair and ship habitability and things such as that. And there's a big industry out there. And so we had these indicators that there was a lot of, of bribery and kickbacks going on to the extent that uh, FBI and NCIS uh, started three undercover companies. Uh, and we had uh, two outstanding FBI undercover agents. Um, so for the better part of about 15 months before I got transferred to Hawaii, I worked this Operation Sandfish and worked uh, at an offsite um, identifying these um, you know, Navy, uh, both military and civilian employees who would come in and solicit bribes from our companies. And so uh, I was at the forefront of technology. We used, you know, high-end, you know, back then high-end uh, video capabilities, audio capabilities, um, and, uh, you know, identified about 25 suspects, um, most of whom were taking bribes on camera. Um, so uh, just an outstanding case. Um, and uh, as a result, I got to work very closely, not only with the FBI, but with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, and so got a real good grounding, uh, you know, in that. So again, did not want to go into fraud, um, but man, what a great, great thing uh, that, uh, that that happened to me. So yeah. uh, uh, worked the uh, Sandfish case, very successful, uh, get my first transfer. And it's to Hawaii. Uh, at that time, I had wanted to go to Subic Bay, Philippines. Everything I heard about the Philippines was great. You know, everybody was getting transferred to the Philippines, having a good time, working good cases. Yeah. And uh, and but, but because I was procurement fraud uh, and they were starting a new unit in Hawaii, I was identified for that. And uh, so transferred to Hawaii and just again, like I did with San Diego, fell in love with Hawaii. I mean, what's not to like for a Virginia boy? you know, living, uh, you know, basically in paradise. I was a big runner at the time, marathon runner, just the perfect community for that. And uh, so I'm working, you know, fraud cases, had a couple of good cases in Hawaii. And uh, in early 1986, I got selected to go work a lead on a uh, NCIS headquarters investigation uh, that at the time was called uh, Cosmos Blue, but later would become called Iron Eagle. Okay. And this, yeah, and this, so this lead was basically, and again, it could have been anybody, but I got selected to do was to go to New Zealand. And uh, what had happened is a, a hotline in, investigation had started and it got passed over to, to NCIS uh, that uh, Richard Marcinko, uh, who was the first commanding officer of SEAL Team 6, of course, the, the Navy's legendary and, and, and elite counterterrorism team, um, that Marcinko had been involved in multiple improprieties during his three-year tenure as the SEAL Team 6 commanding officer. Um, and so uh, NCIS had started an investigation into that, and uh, Mark Fallon uh, and Cliff Simmons, were the initial case agents on it. So they're working the case in Washington. I'm living the life in Hawaii and I get selected to do this lead. I go to New Zealand uh, to conduct the lead, uh, send the information, it was very successful, send it back to, to Washington, DC, and that's the end of it. Jump forward to May of 1986 and uh, uh, Mark Fallon and the then head of the uh, procurement fraud program, Byron Taylor, um, had a disagreement uh, about the direction of the case. So as a result, Mark was dismissed from the case, and we laugh about it to, to this day because it worked out really well for him, and come to find out it ends up working out really well for me as well because I get asked to come back to headquarters in May of 1986 to clean up the case for 30 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and so uh, I go back there, and during the course of the cleanup leave, if you will, uh, we start to unsurface some things, some irregularities, some additional irregularities that weren't originally reported in the hotline complaint, namely 
uh, some uh, big checks that were sent to one of the SEALs by a uh, sniper rifle company in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Based upon that, uh, it results in a further investigation into Marcinko, the SEAL, and the company, as well as several other companies. And I'll make a long story short because it was a three-year investigation, but it resulted in you know, multiple uh, SEALs uh, being uh, either convicted or court martial at NJP or in federal court, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, several contractors, including the sniper rifle uh, contractor that I previously mentioned. Um, and uh, so it was an extensive investigation. And of course, it was end up being kind of a make or break because at the time, the senior seal, and, and of course, under the hitting, you can't make this stuff up, the senior seal in the entire Department of the Navy happened to be the commander of the Naval Investigative Service, uh, Rear Admiral Cathal Irish Flynn. And so, uh, you know, uh, Marcinko and the other SEALs, and there was no uh, love lost between Marcinko and, and Flynn. Uh, they both had two different views of how SEALs should operate, and uh, they were diametrically opposed. Uh, and so there was kind of this kind of sense that this was just a vendetta by, uh, you know, Irish Flynn against Marcinko. And of course, Lee, nothing could have been further from the truth. Uh, it was, an, you know, an evidence-based investigation resulting in a grand jury indictment of Marcinko uh, in the grenade manufacturer for bribery. The bottom line is uh, Marcinko and the other seal had taken a $100,000 bribe in order to start a company in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and Marcinko was convicted of that in the federal court system uh, and spent 21 months in jail, which as you know, 21 months for a fraud case is pretty substantial. Sure. Um, of course, as a result, and uh, I don't think uh, Richard Marcinko paid uh, any credit to me for this. He went on, of course, to be a legendary author uh, and speaker. Uh, oh, based upon the, exactly. Uh, based upon the notoriety that he obtained during the court case, because the court case did, you know, garner, you know, national and international news because of his, you know, his prior status as the, as the head of SEAL Team 6. Um, so uh, it was... Uh, you know, during the course of that, I got short toured out of Hawaii, and uh, which at that time I was going to be the uh, assistant special agent in charge at Barbers Point, and I was really looking forward to that. Had it, had this just been a thirty day TDY to Washington to clean up the case, I would have come back. I would have gone to Barbers Point. I would have stayed in Hawaii, but because of this case, I got to come back to Washington. You know, I got to, uh, you know, be involved in a, in a very high profile investigation sure. um, and uh, which helped, you know, lead me, if you will, to, you know, further successes. One last thing I'll say about the Marcinko case is this. I know you had a chance to talk to Mr. Powers uh, kind of about the era of, of, of military leadership of, mm -hmm. of Naval Investigative Service prior to Tailhook. And then, of course, culminating with Mr. Nedro being the first uh, uh, dr civilian director of NCIS. And uh, I will tell you, during my time period, whether it was in the um, uh, during the course of the Marcinko investigation or any case, I never had any command interference interference in any of my investigations. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. Um, with Admiral Flynn, and then later with Admiral Williams on a couple of cases that uh, I worked prior to uh, his being dismissed as the commander of Naval Investigative Service and you know, Mr. Nedro being appointed as our first civilian director. Um, the only questions I really ever would get from them on our high profile cases was, do you have the right resources? Do you need more? What can I do to assist you? Do I need to you know, brief the secretary? Things such as that. So I will tell you, that was my experience, you know, working uh, with the uniformed officers. I don't want there to be any uh, misconception. The day that Roy Nedro was selected to be the director of the new Naval Criminal Investigative Service was uh, the best day for this organization. It was the right move. He was the right man for the job at that time. Um, you know, and, and the rest, as you say, is history. So I don't want there to be any confusion about that. I, I'm very much so the civilian leadership of, of NCIS was the right move. Um, so, uh, so that was my experience.
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody has that kind of experience. You, you, you know, uh, some people don't have good experiences, but you had a, a very positive experience. It's good stuff. I did. So, so, so after you finish this big case, Iron Eagle, your name has got to be moving around headquarters as, as an up and comer, right? It is. And, and to, the extent, to, yeah, to the extent that uh, I got, you know, pretty early selected for leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, after only, you know, five years in the organization, I find myself as the assistant special agent in charge of the newly established uh, procurement fraud unit in Washington, D.C., wow. uh, initially working uh, with my uh, co-case agent on Iron Eagle, Cliff Simmons. But once he was promoted to headquarters, uh, Tom Fisher became uh, my special agent in charge. And uh, Lee, uh, you talk about uh, a rewarding but challenging uh, assignment. Of course, Washington, D.C., the home of all the major systems commands where, you know, most of the money is spent. Uh, And uh, I probably had, you know, 12 agents working for me at the time, 10 of whom were GS7s, uh, brand new to the organization. And by the way, most of them uh, had no desire to work fraud cases. You know, uh, we were putting agents directly into you know, fraud at that point. We didn't give them really much of a chance to, you know, do three years in general crimes because we had to. Mm-hmm. We had billets we had to fill. And so it was it was the wild, wild west, I got to tell you. Uh, but uh, also incredibly fun, um, you know, having, you know, all the enthusiasm, uh, and, you know, for being with the organization and directing them in an area that may have been unfamiliar to them, but, you know, just using good old uh, fashion police work, as Tom Fisher would say, you yeah. know, going through and, and following leads, following the evidence, you know, using search warrants, using all the tools that we had, yeah. uh, you know, making, making cases. Well, that was um, a good time to be uh, in fraud uh, in the eighties and nineties, right? Because that's where, I mean, it was, it was like the decade of, fraud, if you will. It, it really was the decade of fraud and, of course, the, the decade of the spy. So we had, you know, tremendous growth. I mean, you're hiring in 1989. You were a part of that whole group of unprecedented hiring. Um, you know, when I started with, you know, in NIS, we had, you know, about 500 agents. Think about that, you know, yeah, and, crazy. and uh, you know, look forward to about the time that you came on. We were probably almost, you know, eight or 900 to that juncture, right. which may not sound like a lot, but when you still have, you know, attrition going on, uh, you know, the amount of people that you're bringing on board uh, is, is pretty significant. And um, so we were just trying to keep up with the hiring, the training and things such as that. But it was a great time to, to be in fraud because not only did we have Iron Eagle going on, we also had the ill wind investigation, which still is considered, you know, one of the, the one of the largest, not the largest, you know, procurement fraud investigation in U.S. history. Sure. Um, and the so, most successful, too. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um and so uh, the fraud department decides that they're going to start a new fraud unit in Jacksonville, Florida, wow. and uh, was selected to be the, the special agent in charge, if you will, of that organization. Uh, so got to move to Jacksonville, which was great after, you know, living in San Diego, Hawaii, and Washington. It was really, you know, my family and, and my first opportunity to live in a lower cost area uh in an area that you know wasn't quite as congested so a, a lot of good came with that and uh, had a great squad works in great great cases but of course what happens during that time period that i'm in jacksonville is a uh, desert shield desert storm right yeah and so you're probably wondering you know what impact does you know desert shield de- desert storm have on a fraud age um you know and Really, uh, not much until I was selected by headquarters uh, to work with Greg Scoble, who you know, the first time I met Greg was on this investigation I'm getting ready to tell you about. And he became, from there forward, you know, a lifelong friend and, and colleague. Greg Scoble and I were selected by headquarters to conduct an investigation into the commanding officer of the USS Nicholas. Um, and what had happened is there was an allegation that came forward through uh, the hotline system that the commanding officer of the USS Nicholas on the first day of desert uh, storm uh, had made the decision to fire upon some oil platform oil platforms 
on the coast of Iraq at a time that the Iraqis that were on the oil platforms who were acting as lookouts were trying to surrender. And that despite uh, the the admonitions of his crew and his senior staff, he made the decision to nevertheless uh, take out those Iraqis and uh, killed several Iraqis and took several, several of them as enemy prisoners of war. So basically, it was an allegation of war, of war crimes. And so Greg Skull and I were selected to uh, lead this 45-day investigation into the commanding officer. So we traveled to uh, Kuwait, you know, of course, uh, to the, um, we traveled all through the Gulf. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, we were able to confirm the fact that the commanding officer had, in fact, done this. Wow. Now, of course, um, and he uh, and what he was convicted of, if you will, uh, during a closed court, Greg Skull and I were the only two civilians in the court setting. The decision was to close the, the court proceedings. Uh, it was called a board of inquiry uh, led by a, um, an, a panel of admirals and, and captains. And it was an incredibly tense situation because the commanding officer, and we were able to confirm this, had been advised by the Kuwaitis. Of course, the Kuwaitis uh, had actually fought with the uh, Iraqis, uh, you know, in the Iraq-Iran skirmish, right? The Eight-Year War. And so the Kuwaitis knew a lot about the battle tactics of the Iraqis. And so the uh, Kuwaiti CNO, who happened to be operating with the commanding officer of the U.S. Nicholas on the night of that decision to do that, uh, said that uh, he told the commanding officer, the Nicholas, that the Iraqis would use false surrender gestures. And so based upon that, the uh, commanding officer made the decision to take out those oil platforms. What the commanding officer was found guilty of was he did not advise higher headquarters. Um, he made that decision unilaterally. And so... Um, uh, you know, so it was it was incredible to be in that board of inquiry because at one point the defense counsel, who was representing the commanding officer, threw a law book on the table uh, and said, "You know, the lawyers be damned. If my son were in the United States Navy, I would want him to be on, you know, this commanding officer's ship because one thing for sure, he he'll come back alive." And it was true. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, I tell that story because it was yet yeah, that that case garnered again international attention. Sure. Uh, you know, I find myself at the forefront of the of a, another high profile case, and uh, it resulted in me being uh, selected by NCIS headquarters to become the special agent in charge in Rota, Spain. And well, let me ask you this: before the this board of inquiry, what what happened to this commanding officer? Did they they find him at fault, and what did they do? Yes. He, he was censured uh, as a result. He was retained in the Navy, uh, but received a censure. Um, and that, of course, there were a number of articles. If you were to Google this, you'll see that particularly the L.A. Times, I know, wrote a, a series of damning articles about the decision to retain uh, this commanding officer. Uh, but that was the decision that the Board of Inquiry uh, made. Whether it was right or wrong, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, the, I believe that up to to, to justice. Uh, mm-hmm. But that was the decision that was made. And uh, but it was a fascinating case, one that uh, again the universe conspired to, to help me because not only uh, you know was I working this high profile case, I had the chance to work with Greg Scoble because at that time I was kind of myopically looking at you know criminal cases, fraud cases. And with Greg, Greg at that time was already becoming kind of a legend, if you will, within the foreign <laughs> kind of intelligence area. Yeah. And, you know, and spending a lot of time with him on the road, he really opened my eyes up to kind of the, the broader mission of the organization, you know, our foreign counterintelligence responsibilities. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, I vied for you know, the job in Road to Spain and, and man was just uh, blessed to have been selected uh, by NCIS headquarters to go there in 1993 to become, you know, the special agent in charge there. So tell me about the conditions in Rota, Spain, when you first got there, because it seems like you know, when I talk to people who have been to Rota, Spain, you know, sometimes you have a friendly government, sometimes you don't have a friendly government. It just depends on who gets voted in, who gets voted out. So what was it like for you? Oh, my gosh. Uh, uh, it could not have been uh, a better situation, Lee. Uh, I got to tell you. 
for that time period, 1993 to 1996, um, NCIS enjoyed just overall excellent relationships with every facet of the Spanish uh, law enforcement and intelligence uh, community, also in Portugal, uh, because remember, uh, we had responsibility for the entire Iberian Peninsula, so it had both Spain and Portugal, and then North Africa as well. So, you know, we worked with the embassies and, you know, the various uh, North African countries where the U.S. Navy would make ship visits. So we had just excellent relationships uh, that, of course, my predecessors had worked hard uh, to have. And then, of course, I worked very, very hard as well, as well as my staff. So that was point A. Point B is uh, NCIS, and to this day, still has a, a legend uh, investigative uh, operation, intelligence operational specialist, John Carlos uh, Wiggs, Juan Wiggs, uh, Juan Carlos Wiggs, who has been with NCIS for, you know, the better part of 40 years, who has stayed there, who is just outstanding ambassador of the organization, uh, who has developed relationships, you know, through good times and bad, because as you said, even though I was there during a good time, uh, and the relationships when I became the deputy director with the change of governments and things such as that, it was the exact opposite. There were uh, some restrictions placed upon NCIS, if you will, when it came to our force protection mission. That just was not the case when I was there on ground. So as you read in kind of my bio, if you will, uh, not only I, but my family, we believe the, the best three years of our lives were in, in Rota, Spain. Not, not only because of the great living conditions uh, in, in the southern part of Spain, just because of the work environment, the people. I had an excellent staff uh, there, you know, problem solvers, uh, people who were so dedicated to the, uh, to the mission. Uh, and so uh, it was just a, an amazing time. And I learned a lot, particularly in the foreign counterintelligence area, um, you know, having to deal with the chief of station and the Deputy Chief of Mission and the Ambassador in both, you know, Portugal and in Spain. So it was just, and I had a great tutor. Uh, uh, in my head of my counterintelligence uh, squad was Ruben Diaz, uh, oh, wow. the late Ruben Diaz, and uh, who was quite the character. But make no mistake he about it, he uh, he had just been selected the uh, DoD Counterintelligence Agent of the Year, but not the not the NCIS, the DoD. Uh, because of an excellent operation, he worked during the course of the uh, Iraq uh, storm. war. Exactly right. It was called Frozen Tundra. And yep. so uh, uh, I had him as a great mentor to me, if you will, of how to kind of operate within the you know, fairly shadowy world of, of counterintelligence. That's awesome. Yeah, Ruben was a great guy. I had to, I got the opportunity to work with him in Washington, D.C. when he was yes. over at the Office of Naval Intelligence. And he was uh, he was a character, man. He was a real character. And and at times, you know, the fact that he was such a character belied his you know true depth of his knowledge, if you will, and uh, and his effectiveness. And so uh, I would have uh, just to have had him kind of be there with me as my first kind of FCIA sack could not have been a, a better situation for me. Frozen Thunder was an amazing operation, and uh, you know, not I'm not even sure if you can if it's available to to view now. Uh, I'm sure it's still a lot of classified information. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've really seen much of the story out there, so it must still be uh, uh, fairly classified. But it it uh, uh, was a, a great operation, and Ruben deserved all the accolades that he received yeah, as a result. Sure did. That was amazing. So um, so after uh, uh, so you get you you're. You, you're having a great time in Spain, and then it's time to go back to NIST headquarters, right? No, actually, I had a, I had a stopover in, in Naples, Italy. Uh, okay, so you get to Naples from Rota. I did. And, now, was that time? Uh, was that during the time that the field office combined and yeah, went so, to Naples? Exactly right. So, you know, uh, Mr. Nedro and his team come on in 1992. We become the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. And under NIS, we had these regional offices, as you right. remember. At that time, the region was in London uh, for Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Nedro and his staff uh, did a study and determined that, uh, for the most part, it was a layer of bureaucracy that they wanted to remove and you know, create field offices um, as direct reports, as opposed to 
you know, having to go through a regional office. And so uh, I was the very first, you know, ASAC uh, of the newly established NCIS field office in Naples, Italy. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, the very first uh, ASAC for criminal investigations, Greg Scoble. Uh, my dear friend from the Nicholas case is the first ASAC for foreign counterintelligence. And our first special agent in charge was Doug Tommaso. And uh, could not have had uh, two better partners uh, to have established uh, that field office with, which is, you know, when you're establishing anything new, um, it's 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 a difficult undertaking, particularly when you're moving an operation from London down to to Naples. And uh, as you know from your travels, uh, uh, Naples uh, is an is an amazing city, but it's a challenging city. <laughs> uh, you know, nothing happens uh, fast uh, in, in in Italy. You know, they have the old saying, "Domani," you know, tomorrow. It'll happen tomorrow. Yeah. And, yep. uh, uh, but uh, uh, so, yeah, so I spent two years uh, in, in Naples, initially as the uh, ASAC for criminal investigations and uh, then became the ASAC for foreign counterintelligence. Uh, during the time uh, that was the ASAC for criminal investigations, uh, we had uh, an operation called Operation White Stallion uh, that um, involved a number of sailors and uh, airmen at the time in Naples who were going to Turkey, muling back kilos of, of Turkish heroin back into Italy on behalf of an African drug gang and uh, had, had the good fortune of having Rick Warmack uh, as Thank a you. supervisory special agent there locally, uh, uh, Rory Lynch, um, a number of Gary Marsh and a couple other guys who really just did an outstanding uh, job on this, what became a, a fairly big investigation involving uh, and identifying and arresting the sailors uh, who had brought in these, you know, multi-kilo levels of, of, of heroin into, into Italy. Yeah. And so a uh, great tour overall, despite some of the idiosyncrasies of living in Naples. And that leads us up to 1997. And uh, uh, I was selected to become the uh, executive assistant. Mm -hmm. to the deputy director, who at the time was John McKelney, uh, who Mr. Nedro had brought over with him from Secret Service, um, and to uh, Mr. Nedro to be their executive assistant. At that time, and it still endures, I believe, NCIS assigns a uh, you know special agent at the GS-14 level to be the EA, to uh, basically travel with the uh, leadership team, uh, you know, write speeches, take notes, follow up on requests, you know, everything that comes into the front office. Shortly before I arrive in Washington to take that role, Mr. Nedro announces his retirement. Uh, he had been uh, five years as the uh, director, first civilian director of NCIS. And, um, and so now I find myself in the front office as Mr. Nedro is leaving um, you know, and I'm supposed to be there serving him and, right. you know, watching the process for the selection of now what will be the second director of uh, NCIS. And I got to watch that process all the way through the point that Dave Brandt, uh, whom I had never worked for before, who I'd only really only met once or twice prior to that time period. Uh, and, and of course, uh, he was just an absolute legend within the organization already before his uh, being selected as our second civilian director. Yeah. I'd never met anyone who said that they did not enjoy working for Dave Brandt. And so while I was kind of sad, if you will, to see Mr. Nedro depart, uh, you know, Mr. Brandt walked in and uh, I was his executive assistant as well as Mr. McKelney's for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the universe conspiring to assist me, uh, assist me that that happened then because I had learned more about the organization. And I say about the organization, I already had a pretty good knowledge, Lee, of how the criminal investigative process worked, how the, uh, we worked in counterintelligence. I'm talking about running the business of NCIS. I, I got an MBA working for Dave Brandt and watching his style of leadership, uh, how he uh, worked closely with the uh, front offices of both the CNO and the secretary to kind of state our case, um, uh, how he worked with the general counsel. Uh, general counsel Alberto Mora once said about Dave Brand, he said, 
you know, Dave Brand is the best he's ever seen when it comes to creating clientsmanship. What he meant by that was, you know, uh, educating, uh, you know, our seniors about the organization. As a result, and it was no fault of Mr. Nedro. As you know, Lee, we did not hire a single special agent from 1992 to 1997. To a certain degree, you know, 25 years later, the organization is still paying for that. Imagine that. Well, we had still nobody working. in the middle. Absolutely. <laughs> we had nobody yeah. in the middle because we didn't have a, a single hire during a five-year gap. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brandt was able to go and through his relationships uh, with the E-ring of the Pentagon. Uh, and I was able, I was there with him most of the time when he was making that case. Uh, I watched him be able to persuade, uh, particularly to still budget was still pretty tough during that time period. This is all prior to the USS Cole, you know, prior to 9-11. I watched him, you know, grow the organization uh, at a much needed time. You know, at that time, I think when Mr. Brandt came on board, we had like 825 agents was all. And uh, that was such an insufficient number to cover the breadth of the mission that we uh, that we had. So um, those two years as, uh, you know, Mr. Brandt's EA was uh, the one of the best things that happened to me during my career. It's a non-operational job, right? But sure. I got to learn the business of the business of running uh, NCIS. So, and I know that you had, uh, because you were uh, director's advisory board, right? When Mr. That's right. Uh, when That's right. For, I for remember a you being short time. With us. That's right. And, and it was amazing to be in those staff meetings and watch all of you kind of go around and kind of discuss, the, as you say, the business of the organization. And to me, that always fascinated me to watch, you know, this is how the soup is made, you know. Uh, nobody knows about what goes on in here because this is this, and this is where it all happens. And it was, it was it, like you say, it was a class, an MBA class in how to run the business of the organization. And I remember Mr. Brent used to like throw questions out at us, Mark. Uh, uh, sorry, Mark. Uh, anyway, uh, myself and another agent, and he would throw. We'd go travel along with him on on visits. And he would start talking about something about the Navy and they were talking about the board of directors and film, film and, and he would throw out a question to us and we had no idea what the answer was. And right. so, we, well, I, you know, and he, and he, and he was always really good about going, well, I know, I think what you're trying to say is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was, yeah, he always, he always uses teachable moments. And so, uh, uh, obviously I'm, I'm a, a huge Dave Brandt fan. I learned not only about the business, I also learned a lot about leadership. Uh, one quick anecdote I'll tell and then we'll move on is uh, I remember in the early days uh, after he'd been selected as the director and he was really working hard with both the civilian and military uh, leadership sides of the Department of the Navy uh, to strengthen the relationship uh, of NCIS uh, with the uh, uh, with the Pentagon, and uh, he had had a meeting with the then uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Krulak, and uh, there had been some tension between the Marine Corps and, and NCIS, and um, Mr. Brand had assured uh, General Krulak that for any major issues that, you know, Mr. Brandt and the staff would, would absolutely go and speak with the Commandant, of course, never to compromise investigation. We would never yeah. do that but at the appropriate time. So he would hear it first from us, okay? Shortly thereafter, unfortunately, uh, there had been a, a case, uh, I think it was at a, a Camp Pendleton case where uh, a Marine had been killed during a training incident. And uh, make a long story short, the medal examiner had made the decision that it was an accidental death. And so, but there's a lot of controversy about it. The, the family didn't accept it, the congressional action. Uh, an enterprising Washington Post reporter called uh, NCIS headquarters and spoke to one of our agents at the time who was working uh, kind of in our public affairs office. And this agent, you know, he didn't have a training in public affairs. He was just, you know, uh, assigned to the billet and doing the best that he could. Yeah. And uh, he thought he was talking off the record and made a quote, something like even Ray Charles can see that there was a problem with this case. Oh, well, guess God. what appears the next morning in the Washington Post? Sure. That quote. Yeah. 
so I used to get in around 6.30 in the morning, Lee, uh, to help prepare the message boards and everything for the senior staff. And Mr. Brandt would get in around 7 or 7.15. About 6.45, I get a phone call from the Commandant's EA who says, hey, listen, Ralph, you know, the Commandant is spitting mad. He just read this quote from, you know, an NCIS source, and he wants to see Director Brandt immediately. And so now, you know, I've got to deliver this news to, to Mr. Brandt when he walks in the door. At the same time, Lee, uh, you know, Mr. Brandt had been the head of our counterintelligence uh, directorate before he became the director. Right. There was one of uh, his female employees, you know, one of the administrative personnel who had recently had a child, who had that morning had brought that new child in to show Director Brandt. She was so proud of the child. She wanted to show uh, the director and so when Mr. Brandt walks in, I tell him, hey, listen, you know, uh, director, kind of bad news. General Krulak's, you know, really, really mad at us. We're going to have to go over to the Pentagon and, and kind of face the music. Um, instead of just being myopically focused on that, Lee, uh, he sees the uh, young lady with her baby. He then spent five minutes knowing that he's getting ready to walk into, you know, a crap storm with the commandant, who, by the way, is very, very fiery. Uh, he spent five minutes talking about the child, you know, talking about the employee. Uh, I learned so much about how to treat people from that five minute interaction, you know, and, and so that's just one story of many stories I could tell about Dave Brad about Dave Brand, about his leadership style that I tried to emulate when as I moved up the ranks, if you will, and went to the front office. That's amazing. Yeah, he was a great leader. Sure, it was missed when he when he left, but uh, yeah, it, he yeah. was he was something else. He was something absolutely else. one of a kind. Spend my spend my two years uh, in the front office, uh, you know, and part of the uh, growth of the organization. A lot of new missions. We had uh, some really sharp uh, non agents, if you will, uh, working in the front office with this Lou Buyer. Sure. Uh, you talk about Dan Butler, um, mm -hmm. all of whom uh, were great consultants as as we have been at times you know ncis has looked at itself as agent and non-agent i think that kind of if you will our you know genre if you will of special agents our generation of, of special agents have done a i think a good job of trying to create kind of this you know the one team one fight i know it's such a colloquialism but it's absolutely true uh, I mean, the organization, there's, there's more non-agents, if you will, than there are special agents. So, of course, there has to be this combined um, you know, focus of going out and solving crimes and keeping sailors safe. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dave Brandt really was just excellent, you know, with that, with creating that environment. And I think that still endures uh, to this day. So. I had my two years. I'm then selected uh, to GS-15, and I became the deputy assistant director of the criminal uh, crimes against persons uh, directorate uh, there at NCS headquarters. Just an incredible opportunity for me to get further engrossed in the all aspects of the criminal investigative mission. I uh, was following uh, a heavyweight, if you will, Jerry Nance, who had just done a, and, and Chuck Bryan, who'd done a great job. Uh, of, of just germinating that organization, went in, solved some really big cold cases during that time period, you know, solved all the cases that we needed to solve to the point that I'm then selected to be the special agent in charge of the Washington field office, which is kind of, if you will, one of the flagship offices of the of NCIS, just because of its proximity to headquarters uh, and to the Pentagon, the Naval Academy, any case at the Naval Academy is always kind of a big deal. And we had several of them. And uh, one quick anecdote I'll tell about my time at uh, Washington occurred on October 12th of 2000. October 12th, 2000 was the day, if I recall correctly, of the USS Cole, the bombing of the coal in, in Aden, Yemen. And I got a call as soon as I walked in uh, from uh, to go into work that day. And it was from Gary Hardgrove, uh, who at the time was working in the counterintelligence director. And he had just received notification. There wasn't even an MTAC then, as you know, it was the ATAC. And sure. uh, had received notification of the explosion on the coal. 
And uh, even though news was reports were trying to say that it was, and, and of course the Yemenis were saying that it was not an act of terrorism. Clearly, it was an act of terrorism uh, from the eyewitnesses and from the initial uh, reports we were getting. I get a call from headquarters asking me to call my FBI counterpart, the assistant director of the Washington field office. His name was Jimmy Carter. Uh, okay. No uh, at all confusion <laughs> with the uh, former president. And uh, and so I called Jimmy. The reason I needed to call Jimmy Carter was at that time, uh, the FBI's rapid deployment team that would be going to Yemen would be deploying out of Washington, D.C. And I needed to assure that we had an NCIS agent mm -hmm. on that plane, which ultimately ended up being Mike Dorsey, uh, who did just an amazing job initially. Uh, there on deck. And I know your wife uh, had Kathy Clemens was just one of the many heroes who end up uh, investigating the USS Cole. She can't, so she, can't say, she can't say enough good things about Mike Dorsey, though. You know, uh, he was, and, she said he was just amazing as a leader on the ground over there. Very much so. You know, uh, if you need a, a first guy on, on the ground, Mike Dorsey's your man. And mm -hmm. uh so the reason I'm telling the story is I'm on the phone with Jimmy Carter, uh, and again, it's early in the morning, and I'm telling him, hey, hey Jimmy, listen, I just got this notification. He, he had not even heard yet. He had not even been notified of this. And uh, so while I'm on the phone with him telling him this, he says, hey, Ralph, hold on. I've got Director Free. At the time, uh, Louis Free was the director of the FBI. He said, Director Free's on the other line calling me. He never calls me. And so I wait on the line for about five minutes, and Jimmy comes back and says, man, that was Director Free advising me of the, you know, the USS Cole and the explosion of the coal. And he asked me what I was doing about it. And I told him I already had NCIS on the line. And so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> worked out great. <laughs> yeah, it worked out great. And of course, it bonded Jimmy and I for forevermore. So uh, uh, that all happened uh, while I was there at, uh, uh, of course, at, at Washington. Had a great tour in Washington. Had some great ASACs working for me. Uh, and uh, then I was selected after only a year in Washington uh, to be an assistant director. Can, can I ask uh, you one more thing about the cult? Since you were yes. uh, there uh, working that case, um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like as far as the how the information was flowing from the field to headquarters and what you guys were learning at that time and what you had to put out to the Navy? I wish I could, Lee, uh, but once... Uh, you know, I did my du my duty in getting Mike Dorsey on that airplane. <laughs> he took over. I went back to attend to, uh, you know, the Washington Field Office business, which, by the way, you know, included a little bit more. I mean, let's face it. In 2000, you know, prior to 9-11, while we did have some focus on force protection domestically, uh, for the most part, we were about the way game. All right. Yeah, we sure. were focused internationally, making sure that we because uh, there were other organizations you know, kind of, if you will, uh, sure. focused upon, you know, domestic force protection. Um, so, uh, but of course, you know, Mark Fallon and, you know, and those folks, Tom Vitro that were working at headquarters at the time uh, are, are very able to speak about the information flow between the field headquarters, FBI headquarters. Uh, and of course, a lot of it's the stuff that's made of legends right now. I mean, a lot of TV shows, you know, I uh, had a chance to watch The Looming Tower, uh, which, uh, you know, tells a lot about the Ali Sufan. Ali Sufan was the uh, FBI agent who was the counterpart predominantly to Bob McFadden. I know he told you during the course of uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, retrospective on the USS Cole. So, mm -hmm. uh, so they'd be the ones to answer that question. I'll have to, you have to ask him again, Nick, because I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to have Mike Dorsey on and I, and I'm looking forward to that interview because of the things that he did, uh, not only then, but during his whole career. So absolutely good. So anyway, so we go back to uh, you go back to the Washington field office and then you're kind of ending your time there, right? Yeah. I ended my time. I get selected uh, to be the assistant director for administration. Um, and uh, that role basically involves having, you know, all the business pieces of NCIS, uh, you know, human resources, uh, computers, you know, gadgets, gadgets, you know, all the stuff that goes along with becoming a, you know, an NCIS uh, with supporting NCIS. Yeah. And so I was, uh, my first week there uh, was the week of 9-11. Oh, wow. And uh, I think it was probably my second day because uh, 9-11 occurred on a Tuesday. And 
Um, and of course, uh, that morning, uh, even though I was I was administratively focused in my responsibilities, I was still a part of Director Brandt's senior staff. So I would attend all the senior meetings, including what were then called the ATAC briefs. Every Tuesday and Friday, the director would go to the ATAC and get kind of a world laydown of world threats, as well as, uh, you know, NCIS positioning, uh, NCIS big cases, things such as that. That Tuesday morning, never will forget, you know, the kind of the classic, a lot of chatter, um, you know, about uh, some type of imminent threat, but there was nothing sp specific. And then, of course, uh, you know, about an hour later, less than an hour later, um, you know, we get the notification of the uh, of the attack. Uh, matter of fact, I was in Director Brandt's conference room. Uh, we had already seen both planes impact the, uh, of course, the World Trade Center. We were in this conference room when it occurred at the Pentagon. You could actually feel, I'm sure you've heard from others, the the impact uh, right. there in our in our room. So it, it was incredible, uh, but it was interesting. You know, I re never will forget and recently wrote about it that, you know, Dir Director Brandt, you know, kind of his decisive leadership to every single one of his senior members, you know, about, hey, listen, you know, here's our role. We can't get at all, you know, kind of uh, focused into the minutia. We've got to make sure we've got the right forces, the right people, the right equipment. You know, and, and so we all went to work, and uh, and it was a pleasure to be a part of that. I had an excellent staff at the time. I had an excellent comptroller, Ken Burns. I had an excellent uh, head of HR, uh, Donna Green, and uh, we went through over the next days and weeks and months, uh, went through and did some things administratively that I think helped support the operators, which was my primary job. Matter of fact, one of the things that we established was the annuitant program. You know, we had not hired a special agent from 92 to 97. We were thin on uh, experience, if you will. And so we got the approval, went through all the hoops and trust me, there were a lot, uh, but made the case to bring on annuitants because, you know, we had this cadre of retirees who had a tremendous amount of experience in the organization that we were able to bring back and put back into force. Um, so between doing that, getting, uh, you know, RSO payments, you know, previously, for the most part, getting RSO uh, took an act of Congress. We were able to get, you know, regularly scheduled overtime for all of our hardworking agents and employees who deserved it, who were working almost around the clock. Um, so we did things such as that brought back on 150 reservists uh, to help uh, support, uh, you know, the NCIS agents, particularly overseas with their increased force protection mission. So uh, even though it was a, a non-operational position, I'm, I'm really, you know, proud of what we did sure. there administratively uh, to support uh, the force. And so it was a job I thought I was going to be in for several years. And uh, Director Brandt made the decision that Previously, kind of the force protection counterterrorism pieces of, of NCIS was embedded within the counterintelligence directorate. And Director Brandt, after a lot of conversation with the senior staff, conversations in the Pentagon, made the decision to establish a brand new counterterrorism counter directorate. Right. And, uh, and I thought for sure uh, another agent was going to be the first you know, executive assistant director for counterterrorism. I was in Naples, Italy on a road trip with uh, then deputy director John McKelney. We're flying, we're, uh, excuse me, taking a train from Rome. We've been at the embassy in Rome. He gets a phone call from director Brandt and I'm sitting across from deputy director McKelney and I can hear him going, McKelney going, yes, okay. Oh, I'm sure he'll be a good choice. Okay, I'll let him know hangs up the phone and uh, he says, hey, Ralph, uh, guess who the new uh, very first executive assistant director for counterterrorism is going to be? And I said, the other agent saying, he says, no, it's you. I said, it's me. He said, <laughs> it's you. And uh, I could not have been any more surprised, honored, yeah. but, you know, surprised. Uh, and so I find myself now, you know, uh, again, establishing a brand new directorate Almost overnight, you know, there's the old adage, the old saying, kind of uh, uh, building the, the runway while you're flying the airplane. That's exactly what we were doing when we uh, built the counterterrorism directorate. 
Um, and so for the next two years, you know, if you ask me, I never had a bad job. I really didn't. Not uh, during my 28 years of NCS, not, not, not a job that I disliked. There were a couple jobs that were more challenging than others. And if not the top of the list, near the top of the list would have been, you know, being the first EAD for uh, combating terrorism at, at at NCIS again because we're having to go through and 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 you know get all the people train all the people you know get all the new reporting methods establishing new direct, uh, new codes you know uh, new offices things such as that you know getting people to go to force protection detachments Esta- by the way Lee establishing the MTAC yes. uh, you know and, and you talk about Mike Dorsey will tell you the story. Establishing and building the MTAC in and of itself uh, was was a major feat. So we had to, you know, establish that and build it, do all the hiring. Um, so trust me, it was a. T- and by the way, also investigate counterterrorism cases at that during that time period. And, and also, you were involved. Uh, you guys obviously were making decisions on the new field office, the contingency contingency response field office, right? We did that was part of that. Yeah, I was a huge part of that, predominantly with Tom Beatro. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so that was another piece of it, too, as you just mentioned. I know you were a part of, of that as well, a, a significant part in the early days of establishing the uh, contingency response field office, the CRFO based out of Fletzi. And all that came with that, you know, with uh, getting people to go there. And, and by the way, uh, it wasn't so difficult getting folks to go there. It was when they came out is we, we had made a, a bargain, if you will, if you'll go and you'll do three six month bumps uh, supporting, you know, the global war on terror, then we will do our absolute best to get you your office of choice. Um, sure. Trust me when I say that sounds easier than execution. And uh, and a lot came with that. But we I think we did really good in, you know, staying to the intent in the spirit of that. So that was another piece that, you know, having to establish the, uh, the CRFO, um, it was an honor to have done that. Um, fortunately, uh, as it was throughout all of my career, I had great people. You know, I had people like Steve Smith, uh, Steve Smith, uh, who had come from the counterintelligence director. I could not have thought of, thought of a better deputy assistant director than Steve. I had Mark Fallon, you know, Bob McFadden, other, you know, people who were ingrained and knew a lot about the business, if you will, of sure. force protection. The thing I'm most proud of, you know, uh, right after 9-11, uh, let's face it, uh, particularly domestically, you know, most of the special agents in charge want to take, you know, a lot of their staff and focus it on force protection domestically. While force protection domestically was important, I knew that if something were, to, there, there were other, you know, organizations in the United States, particularly at that point, the newly established Department of Homeland Security, the, the FBI, you know, local sheriffs that we could lean on and that we could, of course, through great relationships, have them, you know, uh, assist us uh, domestically, allowing us to use our forces, particularly where we're the most vulnerable. And that was, you know, overseas and name any port, you know, in the United States, uh, excuse me, in, uh, internationally, where you know, U.S. Navy ships and Navy personnel operate. So I'm really proud of that, that we were able to assure that we didn't take, you know, all the resources from all the criminal investigations department, sure. you know, and, and we were able to still do the core mission of NCIS while still grappling with this this new mission. Yeah, it was a, it was a, what an incredible time of change. Yeah, it, it really was. And, and so uh, uh, did that for two years, um, uh, you know, grew the counter uh, combating terrorism directorate, and then uh, was selected uh, to become the executive assistant director for Atlantic Operations in Norfolk, Virginia, in 2004. Uh, and uh, you know that job is responsible for all NCIS operations east of the Mississippi uh, and in Europe. And at that time, initially in the Middle East, although that was transferred over to the Pacific side, ultimately. So it was a huge swath of land, if you will. Uh, traveled a lot in that in that job um, and uh, uh, just had great special agents in charge working for me. Um, and again, uh, got a, a good dose of working with the operational uh, Navy, 
And uh, and in 1996, 1995, excuse me, late 1995, Director Brandt, after seven years of being our director, makes the decision to retire. Yeah. And, uh, and in early 2006, Tom Beatra uh, is selected to be the next director, the third civilian director of NCIS. And at that juncture, I thought for sure my trajectory in the organization would be to remain in, in Norfolk. Sure. And uh, was absolutely just honored um, when he asked that I be his deputy director for operations. And uh, uh, it, it came at a, at a time when, you know, in, in Norfolk, my daughter was a senior in high school. And so I knew that my, uh, I wanted to get my daughter, you know, finished with her high school years there. So I was TDY in Washington, holding down the deputy director for operations position, still had the executive assistant director for Atlantic operations hat. So, uh, you know, even though I was, it was an honor to be the deputy director of the organization, when I talk about challenging positions, sure. Lee, yep. I talk about the combating terrorism position, a close second, if not equal, was, you know, this first several days of being the deputy director um, because of, again, holding down the Atlantic job, being the new deputy director for a new director who had an incredibly ambitious mm -hmm. uh, and excellent plan to kind of move on uh, and, and build upon uh, the excellence that Director Brandt had built upon. Right. And, you know, of course, uh, what is the old adage? Uh, the best plans seldom survive execution, right? Sure. And uh, what happens two weeks uh, into uh, my deputy directorship, you know, basically a month into direct Director Beatro's time, Haditha. Um, yeah. We get the phone call to come over to the Pentagon uh, by Secretary Winter, then the Secretary of the, of the Navy, and in the room is the Assistant Commandant Marine Corps, whole gaggle of attorneys. And the bottom line is when we first learn of the allegations of the massacre uh, at Haditha, which, by the way, had occurred in November of, of 2005. This is now March 2006. And as you know, Lee, uh, in any criminal investigation, but much less a, a war crimes investigation, you know, every day that goes by uh, erodes your ability to resolve the issue. So here we find ourselves four or five months later, you know, involved in this just this major investigation um, that uh, at, at the time, I would say didn't detract because every investigation, you know, you have to you know, going full force, but the, the politics of it, if you will, sure. the international scope of it uh, really took a lot of our, a lot of our time uh, to deal with. Um, and, uh, and so that, that was a, a real challenge, if you will. It's a tough case. It was a tough, tough case. Tough case. And uh, we had a, a, a young group of agents working at, uh, at that time, uh, for the most part, led by Nada Manley, uh, mm -hmm. who ended up, you know, becoming a, an SES. I knew from that early time period, uh, her work ethic, her capabilities, she was definitely going to go far in the organization, and she did. So uh, dealing with Haditha, while at the same time, by the way, uh, dealing with the BRAC move, um, uh, as you know, uh, NCI, NCIS with the other military criminal investigative organizations were mandated to move uh, from our existing headquarters. We were at the Navy Yard, had been there for, you know, better part of, of two decades, and we're now mandated to build a brand new uh, building and combine with all the other organizations in Quantico, Virginia by 2011. Great opportunity, right, to have a brand new building, that, and that's the good news. The bad news is it was 40 miles south of Washington, D.C., and most of our workforce were, really? you know, living in Maryland. Uh, and so dealing with the emotion of that was a, a difficult proposition. And again, we did all that we could. I was really proud of kind of what we did from an HR perspective, you know, trying to deal with employees, trying to find those that we, we wanted to retain everybody that we could. And we did everything humanly possible to, to do that. But for the ones that just could not, you know, stomach, if you will, uh, moving and driving to Quantico, we, uh, you know, were able to go out and find other positions for them, other organizations. I remember calling several of my deputy director uh, colleagues and saying, listen, we've got this person 
uh, who's excellent, who, you know, can you bring them aboard? And then that's what happened. So, uh, so a lot of challenges during that, uh, during that time period, uh, but a lot of great things uh, too occurred. Uh, we continued the growth of the organization. We, we made every single deployment that we were requested to make. Uh, you know, again, most of that thanks to the CRFO. Uh, we had to force transfer very few people. As you know, we did everything we could during that time period not to force a transfer uh, to locations that we just couldn't get uh, qualified volunteers to. Uh, and we did everything I feel, you know, humanly possible, if you will, to find qualified volunteers and offer incentives. So really proud of what we did in that regard uh, uh, as well. Um, and I believe during that time that uh, we never had to force anybody to go on deployment. Uh, that, that they're all volunteers. Up to that point, and that's it. I'm glad you brought that up because I remember talking to the then general counsel of the Navy, Frank Jimenez, who said, you know, I just can't believe it. Well, all these obscure places that we're having to send people to, uh, you know, for tough, tough missions. Not only is the mission tough, you're away from your family for six months. And we all, right, we all get that. We signed up for that. But, you know, it, it doesn't make it any easier, you know, uh, when you're having to execute that mission, right, you know, for right. a six-month time period. So I remember him just being absolutely just amazed. And it goes to the spirit, right, of the organization um, and, and, and the can-do-ness, if you will. But as a result, uh, you know, uh, uh, we had to, at one point, had to, you know, force transfer people who'd been in, say, I don't know, name a city, yeah, for ten years, <laughs> yeah, in Jacksonville yeah. for for ten years, and 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 it was uh you know excruciating. We did not take it lightly. And unfortunately, only had to do it on a handful handful of times. Um, and just proud of, of what we did in that regard. Yeah, it was good times, good times. So uh, now I, I don't know if this is a good time to ask, but I wanted to go back to a case that you were putting control of regarding the two naval officers in Road to Spain. Yeah. And and I'd really love to hear because I read uh, your uh, your your chapter, uh, unofficial chapter, on this, and it was I thought it was tremendous. Can you can you tell the story of of these two naval officers and what happened? You, you bet. So uh, after I was reassigned from uh, Rota over to Naples uh, in November of '96, um, uh, one particular morning, uh, the other ASAC and I, Mark Fallon, uh, did something that we seldom did. And we actually went and got a coffee, you know, Italy known for its coffees. We had an on base uh, co uh, coffee place. So we went and got a cappuccino. Coming back into the office, Doug Tomasa, the special agent in charge, said he had just gotten off the uh, telephone with uh, Chuck Warmuth. Chuck at the time was the acting uh, supervisory special agent in Rota because the incumbent, Al Di Federico, was on home leave. He was away uh, for well deserved home leave. And Chuck reported that uh, the uh, officer agent at that time, you know, we had office, uh, officer agents in certain sure. offices. Rhoda had, had, had a chair of officer agents. The officer agent, Brent Gregory, uh, who had worked for me up until the point that I was at Rhoda, uh, had not reported to the office that morning for work, nor had his new girlfriend, who was a Navy lieutenant nurse who worked for the hospital. These are two outstanding naval officers who would never miss a day of work. And what had happened, it was after a three-day weekend, the Columbus, uh, excuse me, the Veterans Day uh, weekend. Um, and so uh, on a Tuesday, uh, they don't arrive for work. Everyone immediately knows there's something wrong, right? And so uh, Doug asked uh, Chuck to go over to Brent's home. They go to Brent's home. Brent's not there. Immediately, we know there's going to be this is going to be a, a, a big situation. Doug asked that I go to, to Rota since, you know, I had you know great relationships in place with uh, every facet of the Spanish uh, law enforcement intelligence. Asked that I go over and assist uh, Chuck with those aspects to allow Chuck to be kind of the investigative head of what's going to be a, you know, a pretty big investigation to find these uh, two naval officers. So. You know, one morning I, I wake up, you know, I think I'm going to have a nice coffee and a relaxing day, if you will, in Naples. That eat by evening time, I'm, I'm in Rota. And it led, uh, it started the most incredible week, one of the most incredible weeks that I had uh, in the organization. Because uh, what we soon learned in the investigation 
is that uh, Brent and uh, the Navy Lieutenant's name was Robin Lind, that Brent and Robin had decided they were gonna go out and explore Spain that, that weekend. Uh, by the way, Spain's a pretty big country. Uh, <laughs> no, no exact location that they're gonna be going to, they're gonna go explore. They, they kind of prided themselves as being nomadic travelers. Um, so we have Spain as a search grid. So uh, going through the next several days, we, we uh, basically go in and are able to get excellent support from uh, the Spanish, particularly the, the Spanish National Police, uh, who agreed to put up air assets for us uh, because at that time the Spanish military was reticent to do so for various reasons. So we're able to get the Spanish National Police to do that as well as the Guardia Civil. We get a big break when NCI's headquarters, Dave DePaulo, who at that time was assigned to the criminal division, had excellent relationships with the Navy Federal Credit Union. He's able to get the NFCU to give us credit card information for Brent. We find that he uh, had stopped on uh, a Monday evening uh, in uh, Malaga, Spain, the southern part of Spain, uh, to buy gas. So now we have a, at least an area that we can, we can look at. Uh, we deploy a lot of resources. Doug Tommaso does an excellent job of sending me additional resources from Naples to augment the Rota staff. Uh, so we have a lot of, of resources working with the Spanish uh, to uh, find these two naval officers. We get a big, big break when uh, Special Agent Tony Cox and Angelique Panasini go to a hotel. We're passing out flyers. We find out from the, uh, after he initially uh, uh, had told some mistruths, advises that um, that Robin and Brent had spent the night at a hostel uh, in an area that we knew that had been plagued by a massive snowstorm uh, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, and of course, the initial thought was that uh, Brent would never take what was known as the mountain road uh, to get to uh, Granada. Bottom line is, through a, a Spanish uh, police contact that we had, we were able to get the Guardia Civil. They had a, they had a elite mountain rescue team uh, uh, located uh, not too far from Barcelona. We were able to get them to put air assets up. And son of a gun, after five days of uh, being uh, in a catastrophic 80-inch snowstorm, Brent Gregory was able to, he stayed with the vehicle. His father had been a park ranger in Glacier National Park. He knew never to leave that vehicle. Uh, the When the air assets go up, they're able to see Brent and Robin waving their hands, uh, you know, with about this much of their uh, vehicle showing from having been buried in the snow. And it led, to the most, it led to the most dramatic rescue that... Uh, you could ever imagine with these Guadi Seville members risking their lives to, to save uh, Brent and, and Robin. Um, so uh, NCIS uh, was the catalyst uh, for garnering these uh, incredible resources from kind of the non-Spanish military side uh, and able, being able to find Brent and Robin. And uh, as a result, the office and to a lesser extent, I, you know, received you know, some really great accolades, particularly from the, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, and also from the leadership of the Navy in Europe. Um, and, uh, and you uh, wrote in just, your, you wrote in that chapter about um, these Guardia de Spill, uh when they when they found them, um, they didn't have enough room on the helicopters. One of the police officers or members of the Guardia Civil stays behind, stayed on the ground. By the way, he took all his took most of his clothes off. Wow, uh, and, is... and and place them on on them. So, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, jump forward uh, years later, uh, Brent and Robin are now Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Brent and Robin Gregory. They have two children. What uh, a story for them to tell, too, huh? Oh, very much so. And they survived on fifteen lifesavers and one bottle of water. Wow. You know, in six. And by the way, sub zero weather. And uh, uh, so, were to, did they were able to run the car at all, or? Um, keep... Only very, only very sporadically because the tailpipe was buried, and but they did turn on the uh, the Spanish radio. They had the radio still work, believe it or not, and they were able to hear the news reports. And once they heard that you know NCIS was involved in the location efforts, 
Brent uh, told us that he knew that he was going to be found because he knew that we would not sleep. And we did not, you know, for six days straight until we were able to find them. So a lot of, a lot of people worked that case with us. Uh, uh, it came over from Naples, the indigenous staff there in Rota. So proud to have been a, a part of that. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and it had to be everything. emotional when when they when we got word at the office, that they've been found. Oh, very, very much so. As a matter of fact, uh, when we got the report, I was on the phone with Angelique, special agent Angelique Panasini. And all of a sudden she's just going, oh, my God, she's crying hysterically. And I, I'm thinking the worst, you know, and it's Angelique, what's wrong? And she goes, oh, they see a man waving. They, they swear that it's you know, it's print. And so it was a. Uh, a real compelling case, not not a criminal case, but a, a, an important case, uh, you know, nevertheless, and one that I will forever remain proud of, mostly because of the incredible work that uh, the staff did. Well, that was some, that is some great work. I mean, that's an unbelievable case. It's one, you know, it's one of those cases we always say that one of those maybe maybe you get one of those in your career. And that exactly. was one, that was the one. That was exactly. Wild. Well, anyway, so let's jump forward again. So. Uh, director, De Deputy Director of Operations. Um, so what what's the next move? So the next move is Tom Beatro uh, uh, retires, uh, mm -hmm. makes the decision to retire. Um, I, I've now have been in the Deputy Director, both as Operations and Management Administration uh, for, for four years. And uh, so he retires. And so now there's going to be now a fourth civilian director of NCIS. And I was a part of the interview process of that. And uh, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Secretary Mavis, selected Mark Clickey, uh to be the uh, director of NCIS. And uh, an excellent uh, you know, selection. Mark, uh, kind of he and I had parallel careers, both worked in you know, procurement fraud. He'd had all the right positions. Uh, Secretary Mavis determined that Mark was the right fit for the organization. You know, at that juncture, I knew I owed it to, to Mark, and I, I'd already made the decision for me, Lee. It was kind of up or out. All right. I knew that, you know, having been kind of, you know, Dave Brandt and Tom Beatro's guy, if you will, you know, uh, with, with Tom Beatro being his deputy director, Mark Clookie needed to bring in kind of his team. Um, and uh, so for me, it was always going to be an up or out uh, proposition. And once uh, you know, notified that it was going to be uh, Mark Clickey, I announced my retirement. And I had about maybe six weeks of transition, you know, helping to transition at the point, Mark uh, Clickey. Uh, and uh, it's been decided that uh, Mark Ridley is going to be the new deputy director. Uh, of course, Mark, again, another guy who has a storied career with uh, NCIS. So I spent the, you know, the next six weeks, if you will, um, you know, going through a transition, did all I could to just enjoy the people of the, of the organization. Sure. And, you know, got to spend time with folks who, just because of the pace of things, I hadn't been able to spend much time with. Um, so, I, you know, I feel that we had, a, you know, very orderly transition uh, of the organization to the Mark team, if you will, Mark and Mark. And, uh, and so myself, Greg Scoble, who at the, uh, at the time was the acting director, but had been the other deputy director, you know, we both retired within uh, two weeks of each other in, in February, and the new team came on board uh, in 2010. Um, and so, uh, you know, had just an, an excellent, I feel, you know, departure from the organization, you know, after you know, 28 years of just fun, and toil and blood, uh, you know, uh, just a, a, a great send off, a great retirement ceremony. And uh, my family and I left and uh, and then went into the next phase of life. Well, you had a great career. I mean, there's no doubt about it. 28 years of great service and the stuff that you did and the bill, you know, the, you know, the, the fact that, you know, your career is read on the floor of, of Congress at the Capitol of the United States of America is just an amazing, amazing ending the story well thanks lee i appreciate that it means uh, coming from you particularly because uh you know in your career you uh deserve the reputation of kind of being the operator's operator you know one thing for sure we could always count on lee clements and kathy clements for the hard jobs uh and uh so coming from you i take that as is you know just a huge huge compliment well i appreciate that so you retire and is i i notice i so I've, 
my research on you, you do you go to the uh, Virtus Board of Advisors? Yeah, so I went on a couple of for a couple of companies as as, as on their board of advisors, uh, and I end up working for you know some of the bigger companies. I worked uh, for Lockheed Martin. I was okay. on their contract ca capture team. I worked for Booz Allen, uh, okay. doing uh, contract capture as well. Um, but for a year, uh, right after retirement, uh, I was uh, asked to lead a study. Uh, into the use of the polygraph within the Department of Defense. And uh, it was a huge study. It was a year-long study. And uh, it was predominantly looking at not only the polygraph in criminal and counterintelligence matters, but predominantly in personnel security investigations. So, my by the way, my team also included uh, two uh, retired NCIS agents, Ron Benefield and Rich Garbett. Uh, Rich, you know, having a, a deep history with polygraphs. So it was great to be able to, you know, spend a year, you know, at doing this high level study. We went to every military criminal investigative organization, every counterintelligence organization, uh, you know, every DOD. By the way, there were 21 organizations in DOD that uh, used the, uh, the polygraph, had a chance to come back to NCIS and you know, and, and talk to the folks there about the use of the uh, of the polygraph. And it was a very meaningful study, made some great recommendations. Uh, the study was well published and well received by the uh, Secretary of Defense. So did that for a year. And shortly thereafter, I finished that, Ali, I uh, started what ended up being an eight year association with what was then called the Defense Security Service, okay. but now known as the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, DCSA. I was the the uh, contractor, uh, civilian advisor, senior civilian advisor to the DSS Director of Counterintelligence, Bill Stevens, okay. an outstanding uh, former uh, AFOSI officer. Um, so I had just the, the the awesome opportunity to work with him in his efforts and his ultimate incredibly successful efforts to build the counterintelligence capability of a very important organization. You know, DSS, now DCSA, has responsibility for personnel security for all the cleared contractors uh, within the Defense Department, which I think there's about 800,000 of them. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge mission. Um, and so I had an eight-year association with them initially in, in that role, but then became the senior advisor uh, for counterintelligence uh, and law enforcement to the uh, brand new startup organization that DSS, DSS had responsibility for called the Defense Insider Threat Management and Analysis Center. After the awful events in 2013 at the Navy Yard, you know, with the insider threat issue with the shooting that occurred at the Navy Yard at NAVC, DOD made the responsibility to create what is more or less a hub system for mm -hmm insider threat. Each uh, uh, DOD component is required to have an insider threat hub that would report to a central hub that was called the DITMAC, Defense Insider Threat Management Analysis, Analysis Center. I was the very first uh, senior advisor to that and worked with a remarkable group of, of professionals to, again, establish something from nothing. We had nothing. We had no charter. We had no equipment. We had nothing, and we built it into a, a very credible capability. Um, also had the opportunity to work with Steve Smith. Steve Smith had retired at that point. Steve Smith uh, uh, was working on this project, as was Dr. Michael Gellis, uh, Doc Gellis, uh, who was working for another company, but he was also brought on board uh, by McFadden, um, John Tigmo. So several alums from NCIS were brought aboard for this uh, this organization. Really proud of the work that we that we did. When I decided to leave that position a couple of years ago um, and depart Washington D.C. and move uh, back to North Carolina permanently, I was succeeded by then Deputy Director Sam Worth. Uh, we were able to get Sam in place. I could not think of any better you know successor to the work that I had done. Uh, at the DITMAC than to have Sam, you know, carry on what we had started to build. And and uh, so that was just another thrill for me as well. So, you know, the bottom line is, is that the, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, family and the NCIS family. And 
sometimes it can sound like hyperbole. It's true. Yes. Um, I certainly don't have as much, you know, access to the current NCIS as you do, but I, I certainly have every reason to believe that has continued. You know, we take care of our own uh, through thick and thin. The organization certainly did that for me uh, during my time period. And I will tell you, in kind of the NCISA, you know, the Retiree Association, we do the uh, we do the same thing. You know, this the thing that I always uh, point out to people that, you know, the end of a career at NCIS is, doesn't mean it's the end of life. It, 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 that, you know, we have so many people like yourself and Sam Worth and, you know, Dr. Gellis and all these guys who have gone on in and are major players in organizations that are making critical decisions to, today on the, you know, the, of, an, of an agency that's, uh, you know, it's been, uh, you know, it's committed to, you know, defend security in this, this country. And that's what is so fascinating is that our talent is now being utilized out there by multiple agencies and that continue to see success, you know, and that's, and that's, that's just inspiring uh, to, I know we had this talk all the time about, you know, what do people do when they retire? Certainly people who are new to jobs. I mean, there's Northern Virginia, there's lots of jobs in Northern Virginia, but when I tell people out there that, you know, that are thinking about retirement, I said, you know, keep, you know, there's so many things you can do. And even um, Mark Klukey said this in his interview, he said, you know, you have so much talent as an NCIS agent because you've done so many things that you need to, you know, find your passion uh, of what you want to do. He found his passion, human rights, you know, human rights organization, on human trafficking. Yes. So there's, there's, there's a future out there, even though your time at NCIS is in, you're still going to use those talents that you had at NCIS to be a success somewhere else. Yeah, it's very well said, Lee. And the one last thing I'll say about that is, and I, I, I know that you will be talking with uh, Director Roy Nedra. Mm -hmm. And and I never will forget when uh, Mr. Nedro first came on board. And, you know, there was a lot, of, you remember, there was a lot of apprehension. Sure. About hey, you know what are what are these Secret Service guys you know yeah. what are they going to do to us and outside and, and, the family you know it's like absolutely yeah and, and uh, I never will forget uh, after he had traveled some telling you know the agents and the employees of the organization that hey you know what you guys really do have an inferiority complex you know I, I I've traveled around this organization <laughs> now you guys are really good you know yeah. uh, and I will tell you just kind of getting that validation from him, you know, and, and from the guys that he brought on board, uh, you know, the other uh, you know, external people that, if you will, sure. really, he, he put us on the right path, you know, for kind of restoring, you know, kind, kind of our, our self worth, if you will, how, how we saw ourselves. And uh, so I credit him large in that because, you know, look at today, you know, uh, a former NCIS, executive is now the director of, of army cid you know, former right. ncis executive now you know the director of the coast guard investigative service so right. you know I, I don't know what the magic sauce is i know that we we really worked hard to try to identify what the magic sauce is within the the organization you really can't define it we just had the most uncanny ability to hire really really good people mm -hmm. uh and you know who you know may not have uh, some of them may not have gone to Harvard or Dartmouth or, you know, uh, Stanford, but they had, they had that thing, you know, yes. that makes a difference when it comes to the sacrifices, because let's face it, I don't care what position you have in the organization. Uh, there are sacrifices when it comes to government service, right. And particularly one that has a mission just like NCIS. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of the, the secret sauce of NCIS. We never were able to fully quantify it, but thank goodness we had it and it continues on. Well, Mr. Blinko, this has been a fantastic interview. I really appreciate you coming to the podcast and telling your story because once once again, it's, uh, you know, a history of an organization, one career at a time. And you certainly were a big part of this organization's history. And I really can't say enough uh, having you on the show and appreciate what you did during your time. Thank you for your service and thank you for the job that you did. Great, Lee. Thanks, Elaine, for the opportunity. All right, Ralph, we'll be talking to you soon. Hopefully.